<laughs> okay, so the presentation will be uh, in English, but thank you, Bard, a lot for introducing me in French as well. Um, so, first of all, thanks everyone, especially the members of the jury, for uh, coming today. Um, so I will present uh, the work I did during my uh, PhD entitled Active Control of Complexity Growth in Language Games. So in this title there are two parts, Active Control of Complexity Growth and Language Games. And those two parts are related to two different fields that we will bring together in this work. So we will begin by uh, uh, detailing what are those two fields. So the first one is population dynamics and interaction, and the second one, curiosity and intrinsic motivation. And uh, we will bring them together uh, using a specific uh, model from the first domain, uh, the, the naming game model, and introduce uh, a set of mechanisms uh, of policies uh, inspired by work uh, in the second domain. So we will, in the second part, uh, begin by detailing what are those uh, strategies uh, that uh, we can uh, use uh, in, uh, as a, an active mechanism from this domain and analyze the experimental result and then assess the uh, efficiency of those strategies uh, by conducting uh, a theoretical analysis of the problem. And uh, at the end, uh, after concluding, we will open. The, um, uh, we will show some work that we did as uh, perspectives uh, that come directly after um, uh, the the study of the uh, first one is a study of actual real human behavior, and we will see that there are uh, a lot of other ones that are possible. <coughs> so let's begin. Uh, interaction and population dynamics. So probably you've all been outside at some point and see uh, these flocks of birds. Um, and they're highly coordinated and they move uh, in a, almost an artistic way. Uh, uh, but we also have, we also can observe the, the same thing uh, under the sea with schools of uh, fishes. And uh, those um, Grouping behaviors are uh, not only nice, but they allow them to, for example, uh, escape predators or, uh, well, stay grouped or find maybe food more efficiently, or there are some considerations like this that uh, could be considered. Um, so to sum up, you have uh, um, an individual behavior, of course, because one bird cannot be in the brain of the other bird, but through uh, the interaction of all those uh, individual, uh, individuals, you have a pattern that builds up at population level, an interesting pattern. So it's not the only example, uh, of course, so that was crowd dynamics, but another example is finding a, a consensus at the level of the population or uh, collective uh, exploration. Basically, that's what we were doing as uh, scientists. We divide among ourselves the work of uh, exploring the edge of, uh, of the unknown. And, uh, well, uh, first question now is, is this always efficient? Because we see the birds, we see the fishes, it seems kind of easy, right? But uh, not really. Like, if you see uh, a panicked crowd, for example, they might uh, be not efficient at all. Even like, I think it was last year in Italy, in uh, in Torino, there was a, some noise, some fireworks or something that triggered a, a crowd panic, and more than a thousand people got injured. And uh, so, what are the relevant features? What characterizes? Uh, how can we analyze an efficient uh, behavior? So there are two features that we can um, uh, take out of this. The first one is the speed of uh, the dynamics. For example, if you have a task well, moving or reaching the census or, or exploring, how fast do you complete this task? And the second one is the local complexity. So it means uh, in my local environment, the information that I can gather um, what is the local uh, uh, situation? Is it easy or like 
am I just moving along the other fishes or am I like packed in a crowd and I can't really move or choose the exact direction I go? Um, so, uh, to how could we solve this kind of uh, issue? And so the, the second domain is curiosity and uh, intrinsic motivation. So when you just say those words, everybody kind of understand, yeah, I know what is curiosity, but uh, to define it is a bit complicated, right? So if you take a look at this baby here, uh, so he has a lot of different toys or possibilities of uh, objects to interact with. He has a, a complex environment, and it's by interacting with the environment that the baby actually uh, learns a lot. So you, you've got, uh, for example, learning how to well, grab objects or use them as tools or just even stand up and, um, well, by interacting with the environment, the, the, the baby is doing this. And we know that babies are incredibly fast learners. In just a few years, they learn an amount of things that is just incredible. And um, so they are uh, actually faced with a lot of learning options. Like, for example, in this setup, there are a lot of different toys a baby can interact with. And uh, they switch activities. They, it, the, the, the baby will play with one object and then with another or something. And uh, at um, the moment when the baby switches, it's, uh, the baby is like selecting the more, uh, most interesting activity. So this is an intrinsic motivation. It's not an external reward like food or a pat on the back from the mother or something. It's just like finding what is uh, interesting. And this is so intrin uh, intrinsic um, by comparison to extrinsic, which would be food and external rewards. And um, so by the switching behavior, the baby is able to control the com complexity growth of, of his knowledge. For example, if you would just focus on, I want to walk uh, from like at an age of two months, for example, uh, then maybe it would be better to try to learn to stand up before. And so um, uh, the, the walking would be way more complex uh, than standing up, but then when you learn to stand up, it's less complex to actually uh, learn how to walk. Uh, so uh, this is one of the robots that can be found in the basement of this building and uh, other PhD students are doing work with, uh, with this. So basically, this robot is in the same setup as uh, the, the, the baby before, right? He has a lot of different tools and, and possibilities of interacting with the environment, but the, the robot doesn't know what are the possibilities, what, is, um, what are the, the affordances between the, the, um, the different objects in the, in the environments. And uh, so the idea is to try uh, to design algorithms using what is known in developmental psychology and, and, and uh, well, all the studies about curiosity and intrinsic motivation. But those studies focus on individual level. So um, what about a population in interaction? Which brings us to the first part, the first domain. Uh, so could we try to bring other algorithms or policies in uh, models of population dynamics uh, to uh, make them more efficient or to correct the ones that are uh, not working well. So um, uh, previous work uh, has been done by um, Mikel Kronodeya Gaya, but it was a work that was done in parallel and, and uh, independent. Um, where he studied another uh, type of model quite close to, to ours, but with a, with a different approach. And, uh, well, it, uh, the, the first conclusions were that it is possible to improve global dynamics, uh, population dynamics, uh, using intrinsic motivation. But uh, the, the context of our work uh, is a specific model that is called the naming game. Uh, uh, that has been studied extensively by some members of the of the jury um, and uh, uh, statistical analysis especially of the, the complexity growth of uh, 
the, the naming it has been done, uh, well, it was a thesis of, uh, of Andrea. And um, so because this analysis has been done and because uh, uh, simplified uh, um, without, like with really few parameters version of the model uh, was available, it's a suitable model for like the study of uh, bringing in um, a class of new algorithms. And the mechanism for active control uh, that we have chosen was uh, actually introduced by, uh, by Pierre Yves a few years uh, earlier. So I will detail uh, exactly what the model is and uh, what the mechanism is. So the model itself, the model, uh, the naming game, is a model of language emergence and uh, evolution. So you have a, a population of agents and just imagine that they don't know each other. They're uh, completely, uh, they, they have no language. They cannot talk to each other at the, at the beginning, but they have to find uh, a way to talk to each other. So in their world, uh, they have a certain number of objects or, or uh, meanings that they can refer to. Uh, and to refer to those meanings, they can use a certain number of uh, words. And the, the problem here is how will they coordinate to, uh, to reach a common mapping between the set of signals and the set of, uh, of meanings. And, and the model goes through a cycle of uh, interactions where uh, just two agents are, are picked and they go through this, uh, this cycle. So I will detail a bit more. Um, uh, here, they, uh, this is one interaction between two uh, agents. So one is designated as the speaker, the one who will obviously speak, and the second one will uh, passively hear uh, what the speaker has to say. So uh, first a, a topic is designated, so out of the possible objects or meanings in the world, one is selected, and um, uh, the, the speaker looks up in its uh, vocabulary for a corresponding word. And uh, then the word is uttered, like it says the, the word to the, to the hearer, and then they compare uh, their, uh, well, the, the hearer interprets the word as a meaning, and they compare if the meaning that was interpreted was the one that was intended at the beginning. And with this, you have a notion of success or failure of uh, communication, because if it's the same, then it's a success. They actually understood each other. If it's a failure, well, they, uh, they didn't. So these uh, conditions, how you update your lexicon, how you take into account the information that was, uh, well, what happened during the, the, the interaction. So basically what uh, you do is you always accept what the other told you, you never tell, now I don't trust you on this one, I will skip, I don't consider it in my lexicon. No, this does not happen. You always accept what the other is saying. But uh, if you do that, then you will end up with uh, vocabulary that is growing and growing and growing. So uh, the control mechanism here uh, is that you remove synonyms and homonyms when you have a successful uh, interaction. Oh, we agreed on this. So let's just consider that uh, the homonyms and synonyms are not valid anymore. And um, uh, this results in the, in the following dynamics. So uh, uh, we have two measures here, the agreement level and, and the local uh, memory. Agreement level is the probability at a given uh, time step. So the, the time is a number of uh, interactions that the population has gone through. And uh, at a given time step, what is the probability to have a successful uh, communication? And so we see on, uh, on this curve that they start, of course, by having a zero probability of understanding each other, but they end up reaching a consensus where everybody uh, answers the same exact uh, lexicon. And um, on the, uh, well, this other measure is uh, the size of the lexicon. So the number of different word meaning associations that I have to remember 
um, well, averaged over the, the, the population. So what is interesting here is that we, we see that there's a, a peak. And uh, so I, uh, agents go through a phase where they have to remember a lot of information, or, or basically almost all what was invented before starting to discard options and, and, uh, and agree on uh, a fixed lexicon, a one-to-one -one mapping between meanings and, uh, and words. And this is um, one of the problems that we'll, well, those are the two problems that we will focus on uh, during, uh, that we focused on during this work. And um, actually it was also what we introduced uh, when we were talking about the problem with the panicked crowd. So there's one uh, aspect that is the um, the speed of the global dynamics, which is represented by uh, by this, like the time to reach uh, convergence, and uh, the local uh, complexity is the size of the the, the vocabulary. So, our uh, and to have an efficient behavior, we want this to be the smallest possible to reach consensus the fastest possible, and we would like uh, this peak to stay, uh, in a, an optimal case, below the, the size of a completed lexicon. Um, so now that we define the, the, the model, how can we introduce a mechanism that is inspired by uh, intrinsic motivation? So the, this mechanism is called active topic choice. The idea is that the first part when the topic is selected for the interaction, that the speaker can actually do it actively. And, and the idea behind that is that there can be a, a, an effect of those uh, policies. And so there are a lot of uh, different policies because you can base your, um, uh, your choice on, on many different uh, options. And um, so first, we can ask ourselves, what is the source of the, the complexity burst? What makes a, a situation uh, complex? So the, uh, well, we, we've seen in the curves before that there's a, the complexity peak is the size of the vocabulary. So complexity comes from synonyms and homonyms being present in the, in the population, or in other words, conflictual word meaning associations. And when do they appear? When they are uh, created at the beginning, when uh, one of the agents is selected as a speaker and uh, does not have, as an empty vocabulary, for example, and selects a meaning for the first time, then you don't have a word, you just pick one randomly, right? So this is the mechanism that is introducing the complexity in the system and this is on what we want to um, to act so uh, almost all the the strategies that we will pre uh, present are based on uh, balancing those two um, behaviors so the first one is exploring like intentionally choosing uh, an object or a meaning that does not have a word uh, so far and hence inventing uh, a new convention. And the other behavior is uh, uh, exploitation or like spreading, propagating, uh, I, well, at least one of uh, the, the conventions that are already present in the, in the vocabulary. So why is it important to balance those two? You, you would say, yeah, if exploring is creating uh, complexity, then let's just not explore at all. But you need exploration to actually complete the, the, the vocabulary. If you stop to explore, you never reach a global consensus because there might be meanings that you never talk about. Uh, so that's why you also need uh, exploration. So here, a, a simple uh, representation. You have an agent that has five, uh, well, in the world, there are five different uh, meanings. and he has a, a word for two of them, for example. And uh, three of them have no words so far. So uh, exploiting or spreading would be selecting one of those two, and exploring would be selecting one of those three. Uh, so the global architecture of uh, the, the different po policies and strategies is described here. So it's a bit 
uh, there are a, a lot more information on this slide than on the ones before, but uh, we have uh, mainly two choices here. So uh, the, the speaker, just about to select the topic, uh, asks uh, a first question. Am I confident enough uh, about my lexicon? Uh, do I think that I propagated uh, well enough the, um, uh, the meanings, uh, the conventions that I know? Uh, so that it's meaningful now to explore. And uh, so uh, if yes, then you would explore and choose uh, a random um, unknown meaning. And uh, if you're not, then you select one of the meanings that you know to propagate it further. But there's a second level uh, to, uh, uh, to this choice. When you select a known meaning, they don't have the same history the, those meanings. There might be one that was just invented a few interactions before, and so you know that this one is not propagated enough. But the, the ones that maybe you invented at first, um, uh, and you were already confident about them, well, you don't need to propagate them further. So the choice between those known meanings is the second level of, of, uh, of the policy. So all, all policies will um, uh, when I will refer to two levels of the policies, this will be uh, the um, or reference to this uh, diagram. Okay, so uh, how can we build a measure of confidence? What is confidence about one's lexicon? Uh, so the first thing that we can use is the lexicon itself, the, in what state the lexicon is, but uh, Maybe it's not enough, and you might want to keep track of uh, what happened before, a, a bit of information from the, the, the past uh, interactions. But of course, uh, remembering everything would not make sense, because we actually want to reduce the memory usage. We want to avoid the, the complexity burst. And so gathering too much information uh, is kind of against what we are seeking for. So there's a trade-off between the level of refinement of, of the, the, the strategy, the, the quantity of uh, memory that it's using, and, uh, well, the, the efficiency of the strategy in the end. So a first set of uh, strategies uh, are presented here. So, of course, the first one is kind of the null hypothesis, the, the random topic choice, that what was used in the, in the standard uh, naming game. And uh, a first um, active strategy is called uh, exploration bias. And um, I present both of them here. Uh, so if you have two meanings that are known and, and three that are unknown, for random topic choice, well, you have a uniform distribution over uh, the set of meanings. So you have an equal chance to choose any of them. But with exploration bias, it's just that you consider exploration just as one option. You don't consider those three as, as uh, distingu distinguishable uh, options. And so when your lexicon grows, the probability of exploring goes down. And we can see that, uh, so those are the, the, the two measures that were presented before and was also the, uh, we can retrieve the curves and the complexity peak here. So agreement level and, uh, and local complexity. And we can see that exploration bias is uh, already performing w uh, way better. So it means that consensus uh, is not reached as like an S-shaped curve, but there's a, a rapid increase uh, from the beginning. So this is already interesting. But the convergence time is still kind of Close. It's it's less, but it's still kind of close to the to the random topic choice. And as far as uh, complexity is concerned, there is already an efficient control of the complexity peak. But still, we go over the value of uh, uh, the size of the final lexicon. So we could still do better. Uh, so if we want to use uh, to gather information from the past interaction, what can we 
uh, what, we, what can we take as uh, information? So, a uh, first possibility is just to count the different um, uh, outcomes, so success or, or failure. And for example, if a meaning has gathered a lot of successes, it means that we're confident about it because uh, we agreed, like we we've seen, we had a, have had proof that it spread. Uh, in the population and that we agree on it and um, well considering this count of successes per meaning we can either consider it in an absolute way or a relative way so those are the names of the two strategies that are associated to that and here is a representation uh, of, of those counts so you have here three different meanings that were used by the the agent and uh, those are the outcomes of the corresponding uh, interaction. So for example, for this one, uh, there was a, a failure, a success, a failure, and then a success again. And uh, you can see that for the absolute count, uh, the agent is supposed to be more confident about this object and this one, but for the relative um, measure, uh, it would be the first two. So there is a tiny difference between the two, but we explored both um, uh, possibilities. And here are the, the results. So we can see that convergence is still kind of the, the, the same. Uh, an, an interesting thing to, to, um, to spot here is the, um, the plateau here. So it means that there's a first wave of inventions of uh, conventions. And after this first wave, when every agent has at least one uh, convention in, in its lexicon, then they, um, they stop to explore until they reach this confidence level. You cannot, um, like the, 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 the inventions, the, the, the first wave of inventions, you cannot prevent it because at the beginning they all have empty lexicon. So they're forced to invent at some point. So this is this first wave of, uh, of inventions and that we retrieve uh, here and then the, the plateau is building up confidence on this first set and then you move on to a second wave and, and, and so on. And um, so as I was saying, for convergence we still are like around the same uh, values but here uh, it's really interesting because we can act uh, we can actually control the the complexity uh, peak like we stay under the, the the final value we don't need to store more information than what we will have at the at the end and uh, well you might say but uh, well what do you choose as a value to, to actually say I'm confident enough? So this is a, a, a parameter, like do I tell that I'm confident if I reach 80% or 70% or a count of 4 or something like that? Um, and so the parameter actually can be optimized. We can look for the best value of the parameter uh, that uh, will optimize, like here we looked at convergence time. And uh, here, uh, well, this is the, the parameter search. So this is for the success threshold uh, strategy. Uh, so we have the reference curve here for the random topic choice. Uh, so the, the convergence time for, for uh, random uh, topic choice. So it, here is uh, the same one. And the two curves here are uh, the two versions of the same um, uh, policy. One is uh, with only the first level of the diagram that I showed before, so only using confidence to switch between exploration and, and exploitation, but not selecting known meanings, not, not uh, preferring one known meaning over another when exploiting. And the, um, uh, the green curve includes uh, a second level where basically I will try to find where I can improve the best, the, the global confidence. And um, so we can see that there is a clear uh, minimum here, and this is what we used in the curves uh, before. And here it's a bit more flat, but well, there are a whole range of, of values that we can, um, we can use. The, so 
this is between 0 and 1 because it's normalized by the size of the population. Uh, then we have a we can go even further and, and gather more uh, information and uh, about the past uh, interaction and so the, the, this last family of strategies is based on a local representation of the global state uh, and there are two uh, two strategies called lapse max and, and, and coherence and uh, lapse max is based on a direct measure and this uh, level of agreement and coherence is a kind of a simplified uh, version uh, and so what we have here is a representation of the agent with their own lexicon but they try to build uh, a representation of this lexicon like given the information uh, given the flow of, of uh, interaction and their associated information how uh, what do I know about the global state it's kind, kind of sampling information and try to build uh, this uh, a, a, an average vocabulary of the of the population so we call the um, the measure like the agreement level between those two uh, lexicon the lapse the local approximated probability of success and uh, of course when you build this representation uh, you don't want to consider all past interactions because if you do uh, first you will kind of uh, it, it will have growing memory needs which is what we want to avoid and uh, as well uh, conventions that were present at the beginning may be not relevant anymore because they have been discarded or well and uh, so to to go against um, those drawbacks we consider only a sliding time window per meaning uh, and considering a few past interactions for every meaning and uh, to build this uh, this average uh, this representation of the average vocabulary of the of the population and so if we can for for labs we can directly compute an agreement level between these two vocabularies um, it uh, it can be actually a bit complicated to computationally complicated to define uh, what are the choices that would maximize the the, the lapse um, measure. So coherence is a is a simpler version uh, that only considers the last word for uh, each meaning and um, to build the, the the representations. So it's a simplified version. Uh, so it's not exact, but we will see that it has some, uh, some advantages. So here are the, the results. They are completely different from what we've seen before, as convergence time is, is way faster, and it's almost linear. And uh, uh, as far as complexity is concerned, uh, we retrieve the same result as... Um, as for uh, minimal counts and success threshold, that we don't go above the final uh, plateau. And of course, the parameter here is the the size of uh, the sliding window, so the the time scale that is uh, considered to build the the representation of the the average vocabulary. And um, we can also define two levels for those uh, those strategies. And uh, here we can see a significant uh, difference between the two, uh, the two strategies. Uh, the the lapse max has a, a minimum of, uh, around two and three. So we can actually, we, for, for the lapse max strategy, um, we don't uh, need to gather a lot of information from the past. Just a, a few uh, interaction just two or three per meaning is enough to actually build a meaningful representation of the of the population state uh, but uh, for coherence uh, well y you need a bit more to actually reach the, the the minimum to retain more information but what we see here and also on the previous 
uh, slightly, uh, coherence is a bit faster uh, than, uh, than the lapse max. And uh, so the idea, is, and we'll see later, that uh, with a growing population, it's even more efficient and even uh, faster. And uh, so the idea is that you got two strategies, and one uh, is more costly computationally and may uh, converge a bit uh, slower, but you need really few memory. For the other one, you need more memory, but you converge faster and computationally speaking, it's easier. And so what I was talking about is, uh, well, population size. How do these behaviors scale with, uh, with population size? So this is uh, log log um, uh, representation. Uh, convergence time against the, the, the size of the, of the population. So we can see that we have a, um, a line in log log, so it means that uh, they follow a, a polar law and that lapse max and uh, coherence are way below the, the, the first curve. And, um, and uh, yeah, that this behavior is uh, robust to a change, to an increase in population size. Uh, we can then ask ourselves, uh, what, what about uh, homonymy? So if we uh, introduce, if we let agents have less possible signals in the, to, well, if they can use less signals, they're more eager to uh, use the same word for two different objects. So it will uh, introduce more complexity in the, in the system to lower the number of signals. The worst case would, uh, is the same number of words as a, as a number of meanings. And so here we show for both strategies that if we take an unbounded number of words or just two times the number of meaning or exactly the number of meanings, well, the, the strategies are uh, behave a tiny bit differently, but uh, they're, we can say that they're robust to, uh, to this pressure. And now, well, is it possible to do even better? Like we found increasingly better strategies, but when do we stop? Uh, so for memory, we know that we have the best because we, uh, we have uh, the maximum that is reached at the end and we know that we can't go below this. So we reach the, the best behavior uh, memory-wise. But for convergence time, well, could we have uh, faster uh, convergence? So to answer this question, we would have to find a, a, a lower bound to this convergence time. And if the lower bound is, is reached, then we can say that it's the most efficient strategy possible. Uh, so a uh, first remark, uh, if we talk about the lower bound, it's a statistical uh, lower bound. Uh, because an absolute lower bound would correspond to, for example, a, a highly improbable uh, scenario where uh, one speaker, one, one agent, is always the speaker in all interactions and just telling the others uh, what uh, their vocabulary is. So in just a really few steps, uh, well, th this is really improbable, but that would be the, the, the absolute lower bound. So we obviously cannot consider this as, um, uh, as a lower bound. So the, the, the lower bound will be a statistical one, uh, an expected uh, lower bound. So uh, we said that efficient strategies are linked to uh, few inventions. If you invent uh, less, like if you refrain from inventing a lot, then you get efficient strategies. And so the best case would be over the world population to have only one single invention per meaning. And then to propagate this invention for, for this meaning to the world population. So what is the minimum number of interaction to spread one invention to, to the world population? Well, if you consider this, so let's say this guy makes a, an invention and, and this is the rest of the population. And so you spread it to a first one, to a second one and so on. But in, in this sequence, you never consider one of the white dots as a speaker because that would mean that there's a second invention. So to derive the lower bound, we consider that only the 
uh, black dots are selected as speakers and propagate the um, uh, well the, the the convention. Of course, uh, sometimes uh, as here is selected someone that already had the the, the convention. So it's not spread in n, uh, like the size of the population, but uh, n log n. And if this is for one meaning, then we can say that the convergence time is, uh, well, a, a lower bound to it is m, the number of meanings, times this uh, n log n. And uh, using this, we can define performance measures uh, and to, to characterize the, the, um, the different strategies. And so we want to be uh, able to compare uh, for different values of uh, n and m with the same uh, values because before well you have a convergence time but uh, you increase n but then it's a different one but you can't really compare them together and so uh, we will uh, define performance measures that are between 0 and 1 and so you can compare across uh, all possible configurations and uh, so to get back to 0 and 1 if you have a lower bound and an upper bound or well uh, an upper bound, you, we use this, uh, these formulas. And uh, so there are three uh, distinct performances that I will present here. We have a few others in the, in, in the manuscript, but I will present only three. Uh, so the first one, well, we, we have a lower bound for the convergence time. So we got a first uh, performance uh, measure uh, using this formula. Uh, one that is not shown uh, is the maximum memory. Well, we have the upper bound that is the, the um, uh, well, we have the, the lower bound of the maximum memory, which is the size of the final lexicon, and uh, what we call convergence speed. So it means if you take um, the, the, the lower bound to convergence time, and you look at the state is like the, the, the agreement level uh, at this time, then you can actually, you're comparing those two speeds. If you consider that they're kind of almost straight lines, then the, the ratio here, actually, this exact value, is the, the ratio, uh, like a comparison between the two speeds. So the first measure, uh, convergence time, so comparing to the lower bound. Uh, we got this. So random is way below. Uh, so about 10 times um, uh, uh, slower than the, the lower bound, the optimal uh, behavior. And for lapse, max, and coherence, uh, well, we see that it's way better and it reaches kind of like half, uh, well, two times uh, the, the lower bound uh, here. But one important thing to mention here is that it's a lower bound. We don't know if it's reachable or not. So we have a performance measure, but we don't know if we can actually reach uh, one or, or not. But if we look at the, the speed of the convergence, the, the second um, uh, measure, we can see that uh, the, the coherence strategy actually reaches a really high level of, uh, of uh, 90%. So this means that the, the um, uh, here, the two slopes are almost the same for the optimal case and, and uh, what is observed with coherence. And the last one is lexicon size, so comparing uh, the, the complexity. And uh, we can see that here for high uh, size of population, uh, lapse max is kind of uh, starting to drop a bit. But, well, nothing compared to, to random topic choice. So, uh, we identified a suitable population dynamics model and introduced an active uh, mechanism to control complexity growth. Uh, we showed that it's possible to have a significant impact on the, on the dynamics, both in, in uh, speed and uh, um, control of uh, complexity. And uh, we designed uh, strategies with different approaches and, and memory requirements, like uh, playing on this trade-off between the memory that you use and uh, what you want to reach. And uh, also, the two last strategies are relying on, on meaningful parameters, the, the time scale, which is discrete and uh, has a lower bound. And uh, well, because of this, it's uh, 
way easier to optimize it. And uh, then we showed that those strategies, uh, the, the, at least the last two ones, are close to a theoretical optimal, at least for convergent speed. And they're robust to uh, parameter change, both in population size and uh, number of uh, words. And so, well, at this point, uh, we have a different perspective. The first one is, well, this model is rooted in language evolution and, and emergence, right? So uh, deriving equations and lower bounds, and what about the actual behavior? Do, does this still relate to what humans are doing? And um, then another perspective that we will present quickly is uh, structured meaning spaces, so meaning that here all meanings were equivalent and uh, had no difference between them, so um, well, I will detail this uh, a bit later. So what about the real behavior? So a lot of experiments uh, have been done. Uh, um, so at first with human and robots. So if you simulate uh, or use robots to, to simulate the model, then you just introduce humans uh, in the loop. So this, uh, this is the first approach. A second approach is, uh, well, to make people come to the lab and force them to be in a context where they interact a, a bit like in the model and observe uh, what they do. So um, uh, many different uh, things have been done at this level as well. And uh, the last one is to make it an online game and try to gather information in, the, uh, in this way, either using crowdsourcing platform, so still paying participants, or actually uh, trying to recruit participants by making a, an interesting game, attractive game. Uh, but so uh, in all those uh, experiments, uh, well, complexity was uh, measured, uh, especially in, in, in um, a few of them. Um, uh, but uh, it's only the evolution of complexity that is measured and not uh, allowing participants to actually have a control on the growth of complexity. So, let's do it. Uh, so we uh, designed a, a game, uh, well, putting participants in the exact context of the models that we've seen before. So the first version was done uh, for the, the Crayon Conference in 2017 that was organized by uh, uh, Vittorio. And uh, so basically it was just uh, telling people, here is a model, you can interact in this way, and, and go through a certain number of interactions. And, uh, but it was a bit artificial to people. They would not really understand. And some things were a bit frustrating. For example, success or failure. Of course, at first, you get a failure because the other participants don't understand you. But telling them it's a failure, well, it's a huge drawback. Like They just stop playing after a couple of interactions. Because, yeah, what, I, what did I? Uh, do wrong or and so we design a, um, a, a second uh, version that is still accessible if uh, some members of the audience here are bored during the questions you can play the game and um, well so what are the characteristics of those experiments first uh, well it would be complicated to gather a population of uh, participants, right? In the lab, it's possible. Like you need a lot of organization, but you can tell people, come here at this time, and then they interact together. But online, it's way more complicated. Either, well, if you have a lot of participants available, like a huge pool of participants, then maybe you can figure something out. But then, if you have a set population, but one just drops out, or gets bored, or takes a longer time to interact, then you slow down the dynamics and, and everybody will just, like, it, it won't work. And so what we're doing here is we're simulating the other agents. Like just the participant is the one having uh, like, uh, their behavior recorded. But we can do that because we're not interested here in, in this experiment in the global population uh, dynamics, but in the local behavior. Do real humans use an active uh, mechanism to control the complexity growth? Uh, so, to make the, the, the story more interesting, um, uh, we added a, a backstory. Like, you're kidnapped by aliens, 
and uh, put in a prison or something with other aliens from different planets and they don't uh, nobody shares the same language so you have to come up with a uh, with a different um, uh, well we, you're in the context of the of the naming game here and at the end you get a score so that it motivates you to to do better and there's a notion at the end of failure or success like you reached a significant enough agreement level or not and so we gather data for about 80 individual games for each of the two um, uh, versions and uh, so but well if we gather the data of uh, who chose what, uh, what can we do with it? So the meaningful measure here is the number of uh, inventions because that's what we want to, like, uh, compared to random topic shows, we want to refrain from inventing. So this is a direct measure of, uh, of it and we can compare it with uh, purely simulated behavior. So we go up, uh, around the thing, we take the, uh, the setup in which the participants are and input uh, the algorithm that we designed before. So we have simulated uh, agents and we add one more simulated agent with a given behavior that is one of the six strategies that we have before. And so here are the results. Uh, number of inventions for uh, both um, uh, sets of participants, for both versions of the game. And here you get the random topic choice, which as was expected, a higher number of uh, inventions and it gets lower for uh, other strategies, especially for the most uh, efficient ones. So those are like uh, success threshold and minimal counts with the parameters here. And um, so this is still a preliminary uh, result, but it already shows that in both cases, there is a tendency to limit the number of inventions. And um, knowing this, well, this opens up the um, uh, the way to uh, a set of other uh, experiments in, in this way to measure how people actively control the, the complexity growth. So the second perspective uh, is, well, to have a structured meaning space. So here, uh, a first example is, um, uh, well, you would say if I discover something, I, I discover an object for the first time, uh, or uh, an idea. Well, I might get the idea of other meanings or objects that are associated to it, that are related to it. So maybe at first, the, the, when, when you bootstrap a language, you will talk only about food, sleep, and, uh, and maybe run. Or, and um, after, when, when you talk about uh, run, for example, you can make the difference between run and, and walk and uh, well and and so uh, here in this representation uh, well we have one meaning that is shared by all uh, that is accessible to all at the beginning and then when you talk about it as an agent then uh, it makes accessible uh, further meanings that are related to it and then you talk about a, you have an interaction about the second one and then it opens up this one, this one, and this one, and, and, and so on. So there's a, phen a phenomenon of, of uh, gradual uh, exploration that is uh, uh, possible in parallel to the, to the naming game. And um, so the representation here is if it's green, it means that you reach a 100% agreement on this specific uh, meaning. Uh, and if it's red, it means that, well, you don't uh, agree. Like, there are a lot of conflictual uh, associations. And uh, the size is the number of agents that have talked about this. And uh, da, 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 I can show you... Uh, yeah, well, um, maybe. I think I don't have so much time, but I have a, an animation of the dynamics uh, of this, and we can see that uh, with active topic choice, um, uh, you only explore a bit, but you reach consensus over the, the explore meanings really fast, and then you move on to, to others. In the random topic choice case, you just explore like it bursts, and, and, and it stays uh, red until like everything is explored, and then they start to, to reach an agreement. And um, so in this kind of, of setups, it's... Uh, yeah. 
and so other structured spaces would be the category, category game that has been studied by, uh, by Andrea. We also started, sorry? We, uh, uh, ta -ta -ta, we also started to do some analysis of, uh, of this, uh, this model. And uh, another possibility is, well, the usefulness of, of meanings. It means that, uh, well, um, to sleep or to run may be way more useful and way more common in the language than laser beam or, or defender PhD. Um, um, another setup would be population turnover, because if you have new generations again and again, uh, then, well, they might invent their own words and, and you might have a and instability of, of the lexicon. So active mechanisms in this setup can help to, uh, to, to keep the lexicon uh, stable at a higher pace of, of turnover. And well, other perspective include like uh, swarm intelligence, like uh, drones, like a swarm of drones uh, having to accomplish some task. Like some um, studies could include this kind of uh, of mechanisms as well. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>